Welcome to the Mindful Negotiating Podcast. My name is Max Bevilacqua, and I am joined today by Colleen Tolan, PhD, who currently serves as a research associate for the Center for Women in Business at Rutgers Business School. She holds a PhD in conflict communication from the Klein School of Media and Communication at Temple University, and has published academic papers on the topic of negotiation, conflict communication, and theory building. Her main areas of research include interpersonal communication, language framing, and decision-making as they relate to stressful situations. We are so lucky to be joined by this academic and person with great insight. Colleen, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay, welcome to the Mindful Negotiating Podcast. I'm here with Colleen, and today we have Kel Jensen. Um, Kel Jensen has acquired a global following as a result of his frequent speaking engagements at international conferences, his worldwide consultancy practice, his widely sought after media commentary, and his prolific book publishing, and it is prolific. As a highly regarded contributor to Forbes.com, he has twice achieved the most highly viewed posting. He's also an adjunct faculty member at the Alborg, Thunder, at the Alborg University in Denmark, BMI Institute in Belgium and Lithuania, and Thunderberg School of Global Management at ASU in Phoenix, USA. He's a former chairman of the board for uh, Center, f- chairman of the board for the Center for Negotiation at Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> He's the former chairman of the board of, Sen- of the Center for Negotiation at Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. Um, there is so much more to go um, in terms of uh, credentials and, and resume. And simply for the sake of getting to the meat of things, I'm going to leave it there and just say welcome to the show, Keld. We're lucky and grateful to have you. Thank you for having me. So the first question I have for you um, is, can you tell us the story of your name, how you got your name? Um, well, that, that, that's a new question. I never got that before, but it's a wonderful question. Well, I'm from Denmark originally, born and raised in Denmark. I've been living in several countries, Sweden, the UK, Germany, and now the US. Um, and my name, Keld, is actually Old Nordic. It means helmet in old Viking language. So Keld is actually helmet. I don't know how you should translate that into anything else, but but the word itself. So yeah, that's it. It means helmet in, in Old Nordic. That's 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 a very strong, strong name. Um, <laughs> I have to ask, so I think it's Freud has the idea of nominal determinism that your name somehow impacts what you do. Do you yeah. think this in any way applies to your negotiation <laughs> career? Well, you, you, uh, the, the fun part, if you actually study the history about Vikings, it's, it's not true that, that it had horns in them, in, in the helmet. The helmet was actually without horns. It's something that we invented later on. Um, so if we look at a helmet, it's not as aggressive as we like to, as, as we like to picture it from, from the Viking age. So helmet, yes, perhaps. I'm, I'm very into collaborative negotiation. I'm a strong believer in trust and transparency. So. A helmet might be a little bit opposite of what I actually represent, but yeah, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I guess before, at the top of the flow, we should, I think, define our terms to some extent. So I'm wondering how you define the field of negotiation. Where does it begin? Where does it end? What does it include? What doesn't include? So what, what is negotiation, Kelp? Well, I have to warn all of you that I am living and breathing negotiation. So doing that, I see negotiation everywhere. So uh, I often... Uh, get the question. So when we sign the contract, we're done with negotiation. And what I'm often saying is that no, 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 we just got started. Uh, Because I often see way more negotiation post contract than pre contract. Um, But there's a tendency that some people see negotiation as a phase in in a process. Mm -hmm. And I really see it all along. Now I claim uh, that we all of us have eight to 10,000 negotiations per year. And, you know, when I share that, I often meet people that look at me and thinking he's crazy. You know, that's impossible. But I'm usually just asking the question, have you got colleagues? Have you got kids? Have you got a spouse? Um, Do you talk to your bank, a travel agency, what what, what have you? And I mean, we are negotiating and we can easily translate everything we're doing into negotiation. So I also claim that about 80 percent of what we view as just communication between two individuals is a kind of negotiation. The second one is trying to convince somebody else about something. I would categorize that as a kind of negotiation. So um, when does it start? When does it end? In my world, almost never. It's so delightful to hear that, that we're always <laughs> negotiating. And at least from our perspective and Colleen Hoppin at any point, as long as we have interests, which I think we always have, not being shamed publicly, not dying, et cetera, et cetera. For us, it's just the pursuit of those interests. So everything that we do is, to some degree, our, our best attempt to fulfill our interests that we have perpetually, even in communication. What I want to double down on, which I love that you said, is that you know negotiation. If I'm if I'm 
being faithful to what you said, negotiation and communication aren't really that different. And in, in the spaces that at least that I'm coming from, um, people might bristle at that, right? Negotiation is this thing that people you know, do and it's related to chess and martial arts, et cetera. And communication is something that maybe you major in in college if you're not really interested in studying that much. And to me, there's kind of like a subtext of kind of gender there to some extent. And so I'm just wondering, you know, why then if negotiation and communication are so tied, A, is there a difference and B, you know, how do you handle that difference? Yeah. Well, I, I want to apologize. I may sound a bit arrogant right now, but I think we have for many years perceived negotiation the, the wrong way. Uh, exactly as you said, Max, we see negotiation as a chess game. It's, it's, a, mm. it's, a, it's a competitive process. I have to win, you have to lose. And on top of that, I've seen many, many colleagues um, who basically have been pre preaching what I call smoke and mirrors, you know, uh, smart <laughs> tool to outmaneuver the counterpart, techniques yep. to read if, if the counterpart is lying, um, having tools to win the negotiation. And there's a lot of this combative language in negotiation that, that I'm often wondering about because, yes, not all negotiation, I agree with that, can be collaborative. Um, some negotiations are going to be more positional, more serious, some orientated. But sure. I think our ambitions as human beings is to try and convert negotiation into a collaborative process. Mm. And the way I take it is that I see negotiation as a mutual assignment to solve a mutual issue. Mm. And what I often advise my students and clients is that you're not wrong, Max, and I'm not wrong, and you're not right, and I'm not right. We have a mutual issue that we want to solve. And, and the issue is actually a third party. Look, look at it that way. So it's not you that got a problem. It's not me that got a problem. It's, it's a third party here. So we can both look at that third party uh, as being the problem and, and agree this is what we want to solve. And then it becomes a puzzle where you and I have to work together to solve that puzzle. And I'm not supposed to win at your expense. If you're, not, you're not supposed to win at my expense. So... I think I, I always love to take two steps back and perhaps even three steps back and, and reconsider uh, how we view negotiation and what negotiation should be and could be. Hmm. And, and Keld, I'm wondering, um, you have this idea of, of a smartnership approach. I'm wondering to what extent does that fit in or is that the, the smartnership model? Um, well, kind of. We could also have called smartnership partnership version 2.0. Um, and, and, and the reason that we for many, many years came up with, with, with that term is that I have met way, 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 way too many organizations that when I ask them, what is your negotiation approach towards your suppliers or your clients? They say, oh, we are in partnership. Uh, and then I say, well, that's cool. And then when you dive in and look at the details, what they're really in is long-term zero sum, right? So they've been working with a counterpart for six years. And they've basically been in, in serious on for six years. So they just repeat that positional negotiation and then they call it partnership. So that's a lot of misunderstanding what partnership in reality is. So that's why we really upgraded it and said, well, we got zero sum, we got partnership and we got smartnership. And smartnership consists of some very specific rules and steps in order to, to fulfill that term and, and, and understand that you work in smartnership. So... That's why we really develop those, those additional steps to make people aware of what is a partnership, what is a serious sum negotiation, and what is partnership. I love it. And, and something that I've, I've heard you talk about before that I really like is negotiating how we're going to negotiate. So mm. I'm, I'm wondering what that would sound like in order to get on the same page with what is the activity, what is the game we're playing, how are we thinking about this? What does that actually sound like and, and what are the options to choose from in terms of how we're going to negotiate? Yeah, that, that's a wonderful question. Um, let me start off by saying, Max, um, this is an area where I receive a lot of pushbacks. When I step into an organization and tell them that we have to negotiate on how to negotiate before we start negotiating, um, again, I got this weird look that this guy is crazy um, because people don't get it. But, but, but look, look at it this way. We don't see negotiation the same way. You may um, view negotiation as playing tennis. I may view negotiation back to what you said as playing chess. So we might have a meeting this afternoon and you're arriving in the conference room with the racket, right? And I'm sitting there moving the pieces on, on, on the chessboard around. That's going to be a ridiculous game, isn't it? Because we're playing absolutely two different games. Um, and that is happening all the time around the world. As we speak right here, right now on this podcast, we have people out there who are confused because they're playing different games. 
So what I've seen, and it's not a theoretical laboratory study, it, it's actually reality. What I've seen in reality is that the moment that people invest time sitting down, talking about how should we negotiate on next Thursday's negotiation, everything becomes so much smoother and easier. And yes, we do have to invest some additional time in the beginning, but I can promise you we save that amount of time invested initially several times later on. So uh, it is the strongest um, thing I can actually recommend that we negotiate on how to, how to negotiate. I love it. And yeah, Colleen. I have a question sort of uh, along this vein. So thinking about negotiation as communication, right? Mm, communication mm. may not necessarily be always negotiation, mm. but, um, but a lot, I hear you in that a lot of it is, even when we don't realize it. How do you think about getting, um, and this is sort of to Max's question of negotiating the negotiation, getting somebody to that view of um, wanting to solve the third thing, you and me against mm. the problem. Oh, yeah. What are some ways to, is communication involved in that? What are some mm -hmm. ways to get people on that page? Because I agree with you, smartnerships are, uh, I loved that in your book and thinking about the way to sort of bring two people together. But then I was mm. thinking, okay, what are the tactile ways if you're, mm. if you enter in and somebody's like, no, it's not, it's me versus you. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, to kind of get them to come around. That That's a great question, Colleen. I love it. Um, well, we have a saying in Danish, I, I, I think it goes in English as well, that you, you know, you can drag the horse to the water, but you can't force it to drink, right? Um, and that certainly goes in negotiations as well. Sometimes I'm called in uh, to a negotiation where there's a, there's a conflict, there's a confrontation. The counterpart won't collaborate. And people, unfortunately, think I can do magic, and I can't. You know, if the counterpart won't, don't see the benefit, don't have the interest, uh, don't want to collaborate, there's really nothing you can do. I mean, uh, back to what you said about communication, uh, you should obviously spend the time, invest the time in trying to explain why, um, give the benefit on why you should do it, uh, illustrate the benefit for everyone involved. Um, but after that investment, if still nothing works, if the counterpart, for whatever reason, don't understand, don't want to do it, don't have the interest, um, well, you can do one of two things then. You can choose to do your negotiation in zero sum, or you can walk away. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's not magic. We can't convince a counterpart who won't do it, don't understand it, to do it, if they just don't see the benefit, unfortunately. I, I would love to have the recipe here, Colleen, saying, well, this is the way you, you should actually do it. But yeah. unfortunately, I, I don't have that. Kill, this is a refreshingly honest way of answering that question. Uh, I, you haven't met this character yet that Colleen and I are workshopping, but it's the negotiation wizard. Um, and the idea that you can wave a wand or open your book of spells, <laughs> and that is an incantation. You know, people ask you, what are the words? And when in reality, we know to some extent, it's the framing, the context, the tone, the body language, et cetera. It's, it's not even so much the words. Um, and, and so I, I guess I'm wondering how you think about that, because when I think about strong negotiation or someone, if I'm approaching a client and I'm trying to sell them, I'm wondering how you balance the humility of saying, I cannot make your people do this thing. Mm. Um, and I think I can increase the probability that they would. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm, yeah. Sorry. What, what I tend to do, um, what I recommend, uh, and again, I get pushed back on this one as well, but what I recommend you do when you open a negotiation, I'm talking mostly commercial negotiation, is that you walk into the negotiation, then you open up by looking at your counterpart and saying, I'm here today to help you reduce your cost, to help you reduce your liability, to help you reduce your risk and to help you improve your profit. Are you interested in me helping you uh, accomplish that? Now, when you open a negotiation, I can promise you, the counterpart will look very suspicious at you, but they will say yes, because obviously they want that. Mm. After you got that confirmation from the counterpart, then you move on by saying, and I actually see that your role today is helping me reducing my cost, risk, and liabilities, and help me improve my profit. Are you willing to do that? Now, this is a very exciting moment because, you know, this is what really sometimes identify what is the approach of the counterpart. Are they all in me? I, you know, I want to win at the expense of the counterpart or are they viewing negotiation as a very uh, collaborative process? Mm. Now, if you get a yes on that one as well, then, then you can agree on, okay, so our purpose here today is actually to reduce the negative, everything we don't like and help each other improve the profits. Because back to what I said earlier, it's really a puzzle where we work together to help each other out becoming more successful. Mm. When I deliver a keynote, I often start off the keynote by saying, 
How many of you believe I'm going to talk about negotiations today? And then, you know, majority in the room raise their hand because that's what's on the agenda. And I say, you're all wrong because I'm going to talk about success. Um, and then I'm normally asking the question, how many of you would like to be more successful in life? And obviously everybody's saying yes to that one. And then I say, well, then you have to listen carefully because understanding negotiation is such an important component to be more successful in life. And, but it's not success at the expense of the counterpart. You should definitely become more successful, but that is actually possible to achieve that without the counterpart is paying the price for you becoming more successful. And this sounds like a part or a page or a line out of Nego Economics, which I'm curious if you can talk about a bit more um, in terms of waste, efficiency, Pareto optimization, and what it means to um, transcend zero sum. Yeah. Um, uh, ne Nego Economics is just short for negotiation economics, and it's a mathematical model um, that I created that basically just identify the asymmetric value between two parties. So let's say, Max, you and I, we are negotiating, and we have a number of variables that we need to negotiate. One of them could be delivery time. And perhaps I want a three-week delivery time because that makes sense to me, but you're only able to uh, offer me one week. Instead of us sitting here arguing, and reaching a compromise that might be two weeks, right? We should actually look uh, into the numbers. I, I love numbers um, because math always tell the truth. You know, the numbers come to the table and they tell the truth. So let's say my benefit of uh, getting three weeks or, or getting three weeks delivery time, let's say that my benefit of doing that is 100,000. But your cost of uh, moving to, th uh, to, to, to three weeks would be a different number. Whether it's high or low is not really important. The asymmetric value is the difference between my benefit and your cost. And obviously, if your cost is higher than my benefit, we shouldn't do it because it would hurt you more than it would benefit me. On the other hand, if my benefit is higher than your cost, obviously, we should do what I want. And the difference, just to repeat that, the asymmetric value is Nego economics. That is the amount of money that you and I could split because we just created that. And what we have found, which I think obviously is incredibly interesting, is up, that, uh, up to 42% of the values in negotiation are often not realized, capitalized, or identified. So that means that we could be sitting here negotiating, we could agree, sign the contract, and be very happy with the contract. But what none of us realizes is that there's actually a lot of value still lying on the table that neither of us uh, um, um, identified, capitalized, or utilized. And, and there's a number of reasons why that happens that perhaps we're going to talk about that, but that's really fundamental for becoming more successful in negotiation. I just want to add one more thing. Quite often when I'm working with sales uh, companies, uh, organizations, I'm often saying, how many of you are offering discount to a client? And you know, majority of sales organizations are offering discount to a client. And then I say, do you know what? A discount should actually be legal by law, because if you reduce your price by 5%, that will hurt you. Uh, on your bottom line with 5%, right? And the counterpart is benefiting by 5%. That's a serious sum game. They win, you lose. Instead of just giving a discount, why not work with Necroeconomics? If you're able to identify asymmetric value of 5%, you could give that away to your counterpart at no cost whatsoever. It's basically free money. And they are gaining 5% without it's costing you 5%. So it just makes more sense in my world to try and go down that route. Hmm. And it sounds like held that the ability to recognize value has some relationship to the time horizon, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how many rounds of this game are we playing? Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if that relates to your sense of, of, of trust and trust as capital and the monetary value of trust. And if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, let, let me put it this way. You cannot generate naked economics if you don't have trust and you don't have transparency. Because back to my example, uh, Max, if we should talk about delivery time one week, what is the cost for you um, offering a one week delivery time? And what is my benefit or cost of getting three weeks delivery time? Um, we have to be open and transparent. We have to agree that we want to share those numbers. Um, and if there's no trust, we're not willing and able to do it. If there's no transparency or transparency haven't been agreed, there's a risk that we won't do that either. Um, actually, negotiation to me is really simple because it's actually just sitting down uh, human to human and agree, do we want to be transparent about the cost and benefits on the variables we got? And you know, that could be a bunch of variables. It could be delivery time. It could be warranty. It could be terms of payment. It could be installation. It could be 
uh, uh, education, you know, the list is, is long. We have more than 380 variables in commercial negotiations that could somehow generate um, the, the, the asymmetric value. Um, so it, it sounds easy on paper. It sounds easy in a book. In reality, it becomes more complicated because trust is required. And that, that's why we have renamed trust into trust currency. Because in my world, um, trust is not just a fluffy, nice thing to have. It's actually a tangible asset. It's something that generates a value. Um, so trust is something that, to me, is absolutely required. And I'm, I'm still stunned every single day, Max, that you have organizations that are not focusing on generating trust, how to become more trustworthy, and how they can help the counterpart become more trustworthy as well. So back to, I'm sorry, my, my long answer here, but back to what we just talked about negotiating on how to negotiate. One of the things that we need to talk about prior to negotiation is trust. And, and when I say that we have to verbalize trust in the beginning of our negotiation, again, some people uh, think I'm crazy because they get, they, they, you can't do that. That, that. That's like a taboo. And I'm saying, why, why is it a taboo? Why not open our negotiation by saying, Max, if trust in me declines, please tell me if I'm doing anything that makes you trust me less. And please allow me to do the same to you. So if something happens where I feel, hey, there's a trust issue here, we should be allowed to verbalize that. That could actually help communication as well. It's such an interesting idea to uh, monetize trust. I'm following, and I have I have um, some questions there, but I kind of want to start with, you give a really great example in the book of Teddy Roosevelt's um, pictures not being cleared, and that his campaign team makes this uh, brilliant move, which is they call Moffat Studios and they say, hey, we are about to print this pamphlet. How much, are you, how much will you give us for the photos? Meanwhile, they would have been in a massive lawsuit had they printed it without their consent right. right and i think it's relevant here because in that case um there is no trust right there and and trust isn't beneficial but mm -hmm. um and and i'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the nuance of time and and maybe to use familiar language short games or long games something that yeah. to that extent and trust yeah no that's a great question colleen because that specific story first and foremost i i, I love the story not because it's very collaborative but because it shows creativity from a negotiator I absolutely agree with you. There's no trust. There's no transparency. Um, there's, there's basically no collaboration either because one side is basically abusing the potential of gaining a, a benefit and avoiding paying a fee. And they're just being smart, clever. Um, street smart might be the word here, right? Um, the reason that I, I included in the book is back to what I said. It shows... What is also required to be a great negotiator, creativity, you have to think outside the box. And what I sometimes find is that people are not negotiators. I, I, I'm, I, I love the US, I'm, I'm a dual citizen of both Denmark and the US, my, my wife is American, but what I find in general in the US is that a lot of Americans are actually not negotiators, they're bargain hunters. So they're looking for the lowest price from the, from the cheapest supplier instead of negotiating perhaps the better and more expensive suppliers. So for a lot of people, negotiation doesn't even pop up, which to me, back to what we talked about um, prior to the recording, Max, with your, with, with your dad from being from Italy, that wouldn't happen in Italy. You would negotiate everything. You would negotiate all the time. And, and yes, you got a price from a supplier, but you wouldn't accept that price. You would start negotiating immediately. And to me, the culture in the U.S. is interesting where... There's that tendency, I'm generalizing obviously, but there's that tendency, oh, that's the price of that supplier, that's not competitive, let's go and find somebody that's cheaper. Why not try and challenge that? And, you know, we, we have an inflation in the US, prices have gone up quite a lot, a lot more than we see in Europe. And I think part of the reason is that the consumers tend to accept that it instead of challenging uh, those prices, because why not go into Target and, and negotiate? Why not negotiate when you're purchasing something? I think we can all agree that we can negotiate purchasing a, a, a car, but why not negotiating everything else? I, I'm not saying we should now negotiate when we're buying a gallon of milk in, in, in a grocery store. That's not what I'm saying. But why not just start thinking about that the world is actually negotiable? What you're saying there is, I think, particularly wonderful in terms of you're speaking to success and not just negotiation or why I think some of us are very excited about negotiation in that it's a life tool that should probably be more routinely taught at younger ages. Right. Um, yeah. You teach behavioral economics. And so something that I'm thinking about is the relationship or the idea of the value we perceive out of a mm -hmm. deal 
based mm-hmm. on how it goes and that the objective value. And I'm thinking about winner's curse. I'm just thinking about to what extent should I maybe put up a fight so that the other person feels like they got more because they are looking for uh, that type of win. I'm curious how you think oh, about yeah. that in terms of how to measure success. A, a, yes, a, absolutely. That, that's a very valid point. And that's something I see in cultures that are less prepared to negotiate as well. Um, let's say, Max, then you and I, we are negotiating my salary, right? You are my boss and I'm the potential new uh, um, person, uh, individual that's going to work for you. And we are negotiating a salary. And you're saying, so, um, Kel, what did you expect? What, what, what should be your pay, your monthly pay to come and work for me? And I'm saying, well, Max, considering that I'm going to have huge responsibility, a huge budget, uh, I'm going to be in charge of a number of people, I'm going to travel a lot, I would find a monthly salary of $15,000 would be reasonable. Imagine, Max, that you look at me and then you say, well, that seems okay. Could you start February 1st? Um, Mm -hmm. How how would that make me feel when I walk away, right? I would probably walk away thinking, shoot, if I got $15,000 that easy, um, yeah. how, much am, uh, how much are the other people at my level in that organization actually getting paid? I should have been asked for, I should have been asking for 17 or 18 or perhaps even 20. So the funny part here is talking about behavioral uh, economics and psychology is that I got exactly what I wanted, but I'm going to start in my new position February 1st, unhappy with my pay. And the reason for that, Max, is you gave me what I wanted because you didn't think as a negotiator because you just can't give me what I want. You and I as human beings don't understand the concept of a free gift. It doesn't happen because we have to feel that we work for it. We fight a little bit. So uh, if, if we just go back, what you should have said is, oh God, that was a lot. You know what? I can't make a decision on that right now. I have to think about it. Can I revert to you tomorrow? And then you could come back and say, well, do you know what? Your proposal was a little stiff, but if you could do this and that and then put up some counter counter claims that may not cost me a lot, but they are just there. The second you do that, I will be way more appreciating that salary and that level. So it's really important that we think behavioral economics, psychology into the whole negotiation process as well. Um, and it's not because, again, that I don't feel we should be transparent and I, I really embrace the idea of trust, but there's also human psychology and People are irrational. We are not rational individuals. So, so we have to be very aware of that when we step into negotiations as well. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm personally um, still grappling with that concept that someone could have higher utility if I engage in a game, right? Like maybe I had 30 and you asked for 15 and so I'm over the moon and I, but I'll, I'll, I'll do the theatrics, right? I could, you could have more utility and, and what, and what loss is there. And I also am such a proponent of your trust and transparency and the capital value of that, but also the social capital value of that, of if we trusted yeah. our neighbors, right? You talk, I think about a, a situation where um, in your book where someone is re- like replacing an oven in a, in, in a home and they're mm-hmm. leaving the door unlocked, they're not even there and they're saying, yeah, pay me whenever you can. Right. Um, how do you balance that so that you don't create a generation or students who become thespians at the negotiation table. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's a very good comment. Um, I think trust is, is essential, but obviously we shouldn't become naive. So it's kind of finding the balance between um, mm. achieving the right level of trust without becoming naive. Now, um, Dr. Kahneman uh, have done remarkable research within the field. And, and uh, one of the things that he clearly identified is that we would rather do business with somebody we trust and like that may have the, a, a worse product at a higher price than we do business with somebody we don't like and don't trust that has the most competitive product at the right price. Yeah. Um, so that means the relationship and the trust level means a lot. And, and I normally convert that into saying that if we have a high level of trust, our transaction cost will go down and the profit will go up. On the other hand, if trust is low, transaction cost will go up and profit will be reduced. So back to what I said, trust is a tangible asset. And we actually studied exactly how much more people will pay for a similar product from somebody they like and trust compared to somebody they don't like and don't trust. So um, back, back, back to your question, I think it's really, really essential that we understand that having this high level of trust uh, makes us all more wealthy. Now, I'm originally from Scandinavia, and the trust level in Scandinavia is very high. 
compared to, to the U.S. Uh, and other countries. And why? That's a long story. I don't know if we have time for, for, for that today. But trust level is very high. So that means that that story that I'm sharing in the book is from Scandinavia because that happens every single day in Scandinavia. You have companies every single day in Scandinavia that goes into million dollar contracts and agreements without having a contract because you trust each other. And um, what I find coming to the U.S. is that we waste, and I'm sorry to use that, that phrase, but we waste so much time on contracting and agreement and, and security measures to make sure that the counterpart fulfill what they promised instead of just you know, trusting each other. So what you said, Max, obviously you're going to do that. Why wouldn't you do it? Uh, and what I promise you, I'm going to do that as well. And it just makes sense uh, because, again, the transaction costs go down. And we talk about, I have nothing against lawyers, by the way, but if we talk about lawyers and contract and, and guarantees and all that, it's transactional cost that doesn't make sense. It doesn't create value. And it actually reduces trust as well. Um, there's an North American author, Roger Dooley, that I love. He's been writing books on friction, you know, what creates issues between parties. And one, in one of his books, he's, he's been studying contracts. And what he actually found, and this is very interesting, is that the smaller the contract is between parties, the more profitable the contract is for everybody. But when the contract gets bigger, it actually reduces the profit earnings for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. So that means a small contract makes more sense compared to a big contract. Now, I started my career many, many years ago. I think it was back in 1876 uh, in Xerox. Back then, I was <laughs> those high volume printers, uh, you know, that insurance companies and governments uses and banks and, and, and what have you. And the price of one of those huge printers back then was about $200,000. And this was in the late 80s. And back then, when we were selling one of those printers, the contract was, um, was uh, two pages. That was seriously the contract size we had back in the 80s. I was visiting Xerox just a few years ago. And obviously, they're still selling these printers. They are technology-wise more advanced today. But funny enough, the price is still $200,000. And then I was asking them, could I please see the contract? And guys, the contract today, are you ready, was five binders. So it had grown from two pages in the late 80s to five binders today. And it didn't serve any purpose whatsoever. The only reason that it's grown that much is obviously for lawyers to make more money, I guess. And the second issue is that trust has just declined. And, and that's one of my, I, I, I guess you can, you, you, you can feel it as well, is one of my really, really uh, important topics because uh, trust has declined in the world. And a lot of people just sitting there going, oh, I see. But it's actually a, a real issue. As I said earlier, if trust declines, transaction cost goes up and profit is being reduced. So we have to try and get back to trust and reestablish trust because it was way better in the 80s than it is right now. Hmm. There's, sorry, Colleen. No, no, go ahead, Max. Kelda, I think there's something of an irony in this space, at least from my vantage point, um, that lawyers are so proximate and influential to consequential negotiations when at least an American legal training doesn't seem to include uh, the types of education that we're I'm hoping to purport. Um, and I don't mind identifying moments where lawyers are parasitic intermediaries in divorces, right? I, that's something that hits home for me. I, I've seen the waste and, and also including the resource, right? Money isn't the only resource. There's time, there's energy, there's relationship. And so it can be hugely wasteful. And at least something that it, it sounds similarly excites both of us or all of us about negotiation is, you know, how can we close the gap between the actual and the potential? How could we reach that potential and not waste? And, I think the U.S. is wasteful in so many ways. Um, so I guess my question is, in terms of the field, which has some recovering lawyers, but many non-lawyers, but at least in my experience, um, larger corporations who have an interest in de-risking, they want the larger binder because with a larger binder, they see less risk, mm -hmm. right? And in some ways, that may, that may even engender distrust mm -hmm. to, to, mm -hmm. to pass along this five hundred page binder. So I guess I'm just w wondering, do you think that the negotiation dispute resolution space needs to be less legalistic, more human and less JD centric or um, whatever the relevant degree may be? Uh, I guess this is a long way of asking, where do you see lawyers in this process or as a society or nation or nations? Um, how can we reduce waste in terms of how we think about who should be at the table? 
Uh, that was a great question. It's also a very complicated one. Um, I have nothing against lawyers. Lawyers absolutely serve a purpose and we need lawyers. I'm generalizing. Lawyers are not negotiators. Um, lawyers are a technician. Lawyers mm. is an electrician. It's a mechanic. It's mm. somebody that knows the law and we need that. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know the law. Um, so I need to call a lawyer when I need um, uh, advice on legal issues. Um, mm. Lawyers, again, I'm generalizing, are not educated negotiators. Um, we have educated negotiators and we have educated lawyers. Uh, we also do have uh, educated lawyers that are educated negotiators. I do meet lawyers that are great negotiators and actually do a perfect job at the negotiation table. However, as you pointed out, Max, many, many lawyers have never received any formal negotiation training. Negotiation training was not part of their legal degree. Um, some has, but a lot hasn't. Uh, and that means they're just doing uh, what they feel is right at the negotiation table. And lawyers, again, I'm generalizing, are often educated in argumentation. Um, yeah. And that means, in my world, argumentation is really one step forward and three step backwards. We're not gaining any value. It's all about win-lose, right? And that's what they're educated in. And I can't blame them. They're doing what they're educated in because they're educated in arguing in court. But a negotiation process is, I hope, very different uh, generally than meeting up in court. So um, I think one of the issues we have is not the lawyer's fault, but a lot of organizations feel that it's natural to use their legal advisor as negotiators as well, which is not correct. Uh, again, if the lawyer is actually a great negotiator, go ahead. I mean, that's wonderful. You've got two in one. Uh, but in many, many cases, you need the uh, legal expert and you need the negotiation expert and they should work together and sitting next to each other. Um, just having one of them doesn't make sense. I mean, don't ask me to go into a negotiation and, get, and give legal advice, and don't ask a lot of lawyers to go into a negotiation and ask and, yeah. and give negotiation advice. It, it doesn't work out. Lawyer as technician is, I think, a wonderful, um, a wonderful way of framing that, for sure. Um, so I'm wondering, let's say that, Kel, you are a young and healthy-looking man who's well-dressed in a tie, and surely born in the 20th or 21st century. I'm wondering if you were to go back into your career 20, 30 years ago, however far, and you were thinking about a graduate program, because as far as I know, there isn't really a, a pure master's in negotiation that I think is really just about negotiation, conflict resolution, communication. Where do you think you'd have the best odds of getting that type of training framed differently if a legal training doesn't necessarily confer a negotiation education? Which graduate programs or fields of study do you think would? Or should there be an entirely new field? Um, well, you kind of touched upon uh, a little bit earlier that negotiation should be introduced in our education system way earlier. I couldn't agree more. Um, I have a son who is seven, and mm. I'm actually puzzled why they are not talking negotiation at elementary schools. Um, yeah. You don't need to use the word negotiation. Um, but you could start teaching uh, young students tool to deal with conflict on, on, in, in recess. You could start um, giving them tools on how to deal with life. You could start giving them tools on how to negotiate with your teachers. There might be a lot of teachers who are saying, you know, absolutely not. But, but I, I think we, we can't really start too early educating um, uh, our young ones how to deal with stuff. You know, he has a brother, my, uh, I got two sons and, and, and I'm actually, to be honest, not spending too much time training them on negotiation, but I'm trying because obviously you can imagine two boys about the same age. They are almost in constant war with each other about toys and time and, you know, what have you. And they certainly need tools to solve conflict <coughs> and, and negotiate how to share toys and, and what have you. So the, the tools could be implemented Early on, I, I don't even think it's something we should see at undergraduate. Well, you could have courses right there as well, but why not start having those tools implemented in, 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 in kindergarten already or, or, or what, what, what have you. I think it's such, such an, an important tool. And one of my missions in life is really to try and raise the community uh, of all of us trying to preach negotiation to get greater awareness. Um, so I love collaborating with anybody in this world because I think we are all together in trying to make the world aware of how important negotiation is. And for whatever reason, for many, many years, I think it's improving every year, but a lot of people are just ignoring the fact that negotiation is such an important life tool. Hmm. I think that's 
so wise and so important. And it's um, been an interesting journey trying to teach some of the high school kids in Philadelphia um, some negotiation skills. But I have a, a question sort of bringing back the negotiator to the person, right? So a lot of your job, Kel, is to go in and be the negotiator. But as you mentioned, a lot of us are negotiating all the time. And I thought one example that might especially resonate with people was when we were when you're talking about, okay, if I go in and I ask for 15,000 for a raise and my boss says yes immediately, I have this feeling that I should have asked for more. And I'm actually sort of interested in the way that you are bringing yourself to the table and you are negotiating with yourself um, in that way. And I guess one of the reasons I'm asking this question, maybe I can break it down even more, is that I think sometimes there's, we um, capitulate to these expectations at work, right? Can you get this done? Yes, I'll get it done. Even though I, I'm gonna bend over backwards to do it. And then we're sort of co-creating these patterns, I don't know that I would use the, I think I might use communication mm -hmm. patterns, but you might use negotiation patterns, mm -hmm. right? Like we're co-creating these systems um, where we're, we're participating in our own sort of um, loss of a negotiation before it even starts. And so just as you were talking about that, I thought you might have some really good insight even into how you negotiate with yourself or how you see yourself as a negotiator or how it might benefit the lay person to, to start to see themselves as a negotiator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question, Colleen. Um, we actually did a study uh, quite recently where we were asking uh, 5,500 professionals um, how they saw themselves as negotiators and how they perceived negotiation. And a shocking 41%, shocking in my world, actually said they dislike to negotiate. Uh, I think that's a huge amount of people who um, honestly say, I don't like to negotiate. Now, I think we can all agree that all of us as human beings, we have a tendency to be best at something that we truly enjoy and like, right? So if there's something I don't like, I'm not very good at it because I try and avoid it. I don't like to do it, so I'm not really good at it. So that means we have 41% who admits they don't like to negotiate, try and avoid it, and uh, I would assume are not very good at it either. Now, the reason they're not good at it is certainly not because of lack of education or intelligence or what have you. It's back to what we start talking about. They perceive negotiation the wrong way because the reason they don't like it is because they see negotiation as a confrontation. They have had bad experiences in their life where they had to negotiate with a counterpart and it ended badly. That's why they don't like to negotiate. Um, so it's really uh, trying to recreate what negotiation is because, and we can just revert to what we start talking about in the beginning of our podcast today is, is that too many people see negotiations as that confrontation, the conflict, and that goes with, with ourselves as well. Because what you're just pointing out, Colleen, as well, if, if we dislike negotiation, we are programming our, our subconscious mind to dislike negotiation. So that means we may even avoid negotiation with ourselves. And we're doing that all the time. We're constantly uh, doing that. You know, we're getting close to New Year's. How many people are going to promise themselves and you know, something for the New Year? I have to exercise five times a, a week in the new year. And then they start negotiating. Well, I guess four times would be okay. Three would probably be okay. Oh, I, you know, yeah. two is absolutely okay. You know, that's a negotiation going on with yourself as well. So we have all of these negotiations every single day. Um, and if we dislike and walk away from negotiation, we may walk away from negotiation with ourselves as well. And that, I think that's really important that we acknowledge that we are negotiating with ourselves, and we should basically be negotiating with ourselves in a very collaborative way as well, right? Because we want to create a win-win with ourselves when we're negotiating internally. Hmm. Well, one wonders if, if there's a relationship between, um, and I'm, I'm speaking in broad generalizations as well, mental health epidemics and perception of self in terms of self-value. Like we ask for what we think we're worth to some extent. And I, I personally was not educated in how to speak with myself or how to identify those voices, which were mine, which were programmed part of the family and, and why sometimes do I want to, you know, stay in bed versus get up and go for a run? Like, what is the difference and how do I routinely do that? Yes. Um, so I'm thinking two things and, and I want to make sure because we've been talking around your book, but I want to name it directly. You've written dozens of books, but you have negotiation essentials here. And I'm wondering who this book is for, why this book? And just to make it more complicated, because I know you can handle many things and I think that's a softball. I'm also thinking that we've talked thematically about binaries, right? Is it either win or lose? Is it, is it, is it mine or is it yours? 
that we want to break out of this thinking. And you kind of mentioned that in terms of like looking at something as a, as a third phenomenon or a third chair. Um, as a society, or at least from your vantage point, especially in the U.S., how can we break into, how can we break out of that zero-sum dynamic where suggesting one thing seems to imply the negation of another? Mm. Um, how many hours have we got, Max? Because this is, <laughs> this, this, is, this is a huge topic. Well, let's uh, negotiate. I, I could have given you five, but you only asked for three. <laughs> um, I, 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 I truly uh, like your question because it's so important. Um, one thing, not now I have to be careful. I, 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 again, I don't want to offend anybody. I really, truly enjoy the U.S. And, and, and the U.S. is, is remarkable uh, at so many things. But I do see a certain macho culture in the U.S. that I don't see the same way in Europe. Yeah. Um, there's a tendency that we bring up our boys and try and make them uh, create men by um, saying that they have to be very macho orientated. And I don't know whether it's because I'm coming from Scandinavia, but... You know, equality level in Scandinavia is very high. You know, the, the equality between genders. I was actually just reading an article the other day saying that Denmark was, was found to be the country, the, the best place in the world for a woman to live because equality is so high. Um, so I, I think we are raised differently in Denmark, uh, equality-wise, and men are not raised necessarily to be macho men, if you understand what I mean. So there's a different approach to genders and there's a different approach to collaboration um, where the whole com com being competitive is not so much about you, but the group. One thing I notice as a, as a clear difference in schooling system is that in the US, and there's a lot of good, good and upsides about that, but you celebrate the individual way more than you would do in, in Scandinavia. In, in Scandinavia, it's a class exercise. It's the class or the group in the class that mm -hmm. solved the problem. Uh, in the U.S. is individual testing. It's how you perform. You're being celebrated as an individual. So the society, again, I'm generalizing, is promoting the idea that you win. And, you know, it's up to you. You win. You are victorious. Uh, you are the best in class. And in, I don't know whether you saw that, but, but Finland in the Nordic as well comes out constantly with the best educational system in the world. And for instance, they never have homework in Finland because they just figured out a very different way of doing it. And they are working on a group exercise as well, where it's not so much the individual. And I think, again, there's nothing wrong with competition. I'm in favor of competition in general. But you could have healthy competition, you could have unhealthy competition. Um, and I think a group exercise and the focus on, on the negative in being macho is very, very important. And, and another thing, just to, to wrap this one up, a clear difference I see, again, between Scandinavia and the U.S. is that there's a lot of terms in business in the U.S. that is related either to warfare or sports. You know, defense, offense, uh, all of that, you know. And, and when you use those terms like that, again, you program your brain to think that way. And, um, you know, to me, a negotiation is not a football game. Uh, it is not. It's a very different thing. I understand why a football game and sport have to be competitive, because if that was collaborative, it would be boring to watch, right? Because... The teams will collaborate, and who won, who knows? And that removes the exciting uh, thing about watching sports. But a negotiation is not a sport event. It's not where you have some referees or judges or audience sitting there watching and applauding when you look good or sound smart. It's about generating value for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's a kind of, a, and it's a huge topic. That's why I was saying, do we have hours for this? I think there's, there's a thing in the U.S. where we obviously have to focus on being competitive, because I think that's important, but at the same time, not um, losing the good for everybody by focusing on one. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that uh, I, I've noticed in the US, I've been here for many years now, but that there's, a, there's a, a very different approach to collaboration between organizations in the US than I see in Scandinavia. In, in Scandinavia, you have a tendency that, yeah, happily share your IP or knowledge because it's good for everybody. Yeah, where I yeah. see a lot of organizations in the U.S. are very protective. You know, oh, I you have to sign 33 NDAs before we can start talking about what we do. But I know what you're doing. But, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> you know we have to be so careful not sharing anything. Um, and, and it's a very <coughs> different approach where I think that, that the whole collaborative approach, again, in society is, is a good thing. And I'm often wondering, you know, as I said, I, I, I repeated many times, I do love this country very much. But... It's interesting to me how much effort we waste in the U.S. fighting each other 
instead of collaborating and then dealing with the outside where we might have real issues. Um, again, so yeah. internally collaborating could just make the country so much stronger. And I actually think, I just have to mention that, I think conflict is a good thing because mm. conflict develops new ideas and actually generate progress. We just have to figure out how to deal with conflicts because I've seen since I've, I've arrived here that conflicts have moved into something where you're wrong and I'm right. And if you're yeah. saying something, Max, that I don't agree with, you obviously unintelligent and, and uh, unintelligent and wrong, and I'm right. You know, I'm not even listening to you. Um, we have a mutual colleague, uh, Dr. Dan Sapiro from Harvard, that I really adore. He's doing outstanding work and have some great dimensions. And you know, he's talking about the tribal thing. You know, we yeah. are more in tribes today than we were 20 years ago, which is scary. You know, so we are we are tribal. So I'm with you, uh, Max and, and Colleen, because we agree and like the same stuff. So we are watching the same thing, reading the same thing. And people who are outside our tribe are not our friends. You know, and we don't even want to listen to them and we don't want to talk to them. And that, that is a dangerous progress that we kind of, uh, you know, just throw people out that have a, dis a, a very different opinion. So I can sit down and, and, and listen to them. It could, we, you know, we might learn something. We're broaching large topics that I want to keep talking about in terms of you know, individualistic versus collectivistic societies, you know, what happens when we go to the other end, too collectivistic. But for sure, there is an irony, I think, even I'm just saying the negotiation space of how fractious the space can be or how individual oriented it can be when in reality, just like you're saying, if we believe in a network effect of people who know how to negotiate collaboratively, why aren't we sharing these things? Isn't that what we want? And to some extent, one wonders if Civiliz the project of civilization is too boring because it's collaborative and no one is losing or, right. or something like that. So mm. I don't know what that says about our attention and our, and our interests. Um, we can go in a lot of different directions, but again, I just want to come back. A, I want to be mindful of your time whenever you need to go, let us know. Um, but also your book um, is negotiation essentials. And I think essential is a good word in that it deals with life as well as kind of the, the substructure that undergirds many types of negotiations. And, and I'm Curious just to hear more about it and, and who you think would, would most benefit from it. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. Now, first and foremost, I am a, a commercial negotiator. And, and I'm, I'm mentioning that specifically because um, I, I have seen a number, both in Europe and, and in North America, of ex-hostage negotiators who are entering the field of commercial negotiation. Yeah. Um, they, they are retiring from law enforcement and uh, then they are using the experience and the skills and the education that they have in hostage negotiation to move into commercial negotiations. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I really admire what they're doing as hostage negotiators, such an important job. And they're saving lives and, and it, it is remarkable. Uh, having said that, you know, if there was a hostage thing going on around the corner right now, Max, don't call me. I would have no idea what to do. Yeah. And unfortunately, a hostage negotiator don't have a clue about commercial negotiation either. They have some tools and techniques in their back that they can yeah. use, absolutely. But one thing that is really important talking commercial negotiation is value. I think we have to realize one thing. There's only one reason why two uh, commercial organizations are negotiating with each other. That is to create value and distribute value. That's why. Uh, if, you know, if that was not the case, they would not meet up for any negotiation. Um, and what I see in general is that, back to what we talked about earlier, what you, what, what you just meant, mentioned about society in general, we obviously like the exciting things and, and, and you know, it sounds cool being a hostage negotiator, but, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a different approach to negotiation. Uh, it's a different tool set. And talking about negotiation, what it is, there's so many ways we negotiate, there's so many areas where we negotiate. And I, I just want to emphasize that commercial and hostage negotiation is not the same. So what I'm saying is that if you are getting into hostage negotiation, don't read my book because it won't make any sense. I mean, you cannot <laughs> sit down with, with, the, with the criminal on the other side and say, let's find some naked economics here. I want to, I yeah. want, I, I want to create asymmetric value. You know, what's, yeah, what's your weighted average you? cost of capital? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't work. Absolutely not. This book is for um, everybody that is working to generate value. And value doesn't have to be a monetary value. Value could be time nice. or politics or interest or whatever. But it's everybody who want to create a mutual value. It's every, everybody who would like to try and change the way we perceive negotiation. It is everybody who want to be more successful. So it's basically everybody that is negotiating, whether it's a student or it's an employee or it's a 
it's a legal pro, uh, pro or wh whatever you might have, somebody who's negotiating with the interest and focus on generating value. That covers a lot. I like it. Um, I'm interested, I, I hear the dichotomy of sort of a, a general goal and negotiation maybe not being totally simpatico um, with something as, as dramatic or as intense as, as hostage negotiation. One thing I've learned a lot from um, some of the hostage negotiators I've gotten to collaborate with and listen to is the way that they go about a discovery process. And you talk mm -hmm. about this in your book as well. You talk about mm -hmm. um, the spirit of generosity and usually who's, whoever is giving first um, is sort of in a, in oddly in the position of power a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit more about question asking and that discovery process in a, in a negotiation. And specifically, I just want to give a shout out, Melissa Fortunato, who's an yeah. excellent um, negotiator. And she, she always, I'll be talking about her with a, a, talking to her about a situation. She always has a, I wonder why that person did that. Mm. And coming mm. from this place yeah. of humanity and, and mm. sort of taking every human action as having, even if it's unclear to the person, a reason or a motivation and sort of, um, yeah looking through that discovery process. And I actually think you, you talk about that well in your book. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, yeah. learning what you don't know in a negotiation. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've been saying for years that a journalist could actually be a great negotiator because mm. one thing they are trained in is asking questions uh, and asking good questions and asking the right questions at the right time and getting information out of the counterpart. So. Um, I have successfully actually tried it out, inviting journalists into a negotiation with no other purpose than just asking questions to the counterpart. And it's been extremely successful every single mm -hmm. time. Now, we don't all have time to both educate ourselves as legal professionals and journalists and hostage negotiators and everything. But obviously, that would be the perfect package if we had all of that. Um, questions, Colleen, without any doubt, is essential for uh, also the philosophy I have about generating um, um, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the value, the, um, the, the mutual value that we're able to, to, to create. Um, it, and, and the reason I'm saying that is that I see way too often that negotiators are just arguing. You know, uh, I want it because it's standard in our industry. You just have to do it because all your competitors are doing that. Um, and, and what I'm normally saying is that you should actually um, try and be quiet once in a while and just listen to the counterpart and then ask questions, not just listening to prepare yourself to say something in the next moment, but listen to ask a question. And I often, often use the term that you should replace the sound of the word from the counterpart with the sound of a cash register, because when somebody raises a topic, they're doing it because they have an interest in it. Otherwise, they wouldn't raise it. So, for instance, back to the example I gave earlier with Max and I, where I was saying, Hey, Colleen, I would like a three weeks delivery time. You should not be saying, well, we can't do that. And nobody else has ever been asking for that. Or you shouldn't just say, okay, sure, we can do that. What you should do, obviously, is asking a question. So why, Keld, is it that you want three weeks delivery? What is the value to you if we are able to accomplish that? You know, back to the whole question. So, and what makes it difficult is actually, it's, it's the subtle message from the counterpart we have to listen for. Because I'm, obvi I'm obviously not stepping into this negotiation saying, Colleen, I'm making a million if we could have three-week delivery time. I'm, I will never be saying that. I'll just be kindly and, and humbly and, and very subtle mentioning that I would like to have three weeks delivery time. And you have to pick that up. So, uh, and a journalist is educated in doing exactly that. You know, they're listening for the small, subtle signals, and then they just hit with a question right there. So why was it? What is the reason? What is the background? Um, that was a long uh, answer to, to your question, Colleen, but... but Questions without any doubt is very important. And I completely concur with you that hostage negotiators are great at that. They're educated in specifically that. Now, just back to what I said and connected it into commercial negotiation is that you're doing that to generate value. And, and my purpose as, an, as a commercial negotiator by asking the question is figuring out what is the financial value of the counterpart by getting a three-week uh, time, you know. And that's really the essence, Get, getting back to smartnership versus zero sum and, and, and all that. So question techniques, essential. I mean, they are more than, than essential. They're really important. I have what I, what I think is a concluding question, not, but, but please feel free to share anything else. Um, just to kind of bring one more thematic tension to this, which is I think the idea of value and people, people being attracted to the negotiation field because they see value as money. Um, I'm wondering, because that seems so 
rational and economic in a sense that, yeah, you're objective with your bottom line and, and that brings people to the table. And this is often, I, I think, where people are entering. How can I make more money or how can I get taken advantage of less, right? There are many reasons. Um, I'm wondering, do you see a difference in the people that are saying, okay, well, I, now, I, now that I understand the, the financial benefit of trust, how they negotiate versus someone, and forgive the, the religious studies background that we come from, but like more of a Martin Buber, I, thou relationship, right? So like, I'm wondering, I'm all for facilitating someone through here's where you're at, interested in money, to here's why you should care about another person. But I'm wondering if you see differences in the way people negotiate based on their starting points of, I guess we're, we're dancing around authenticity to an extent. Um, that, it, it, that, that, that's a great question. And, and again, it's down to obviously what the content of your negotiation is all about. Sure. Um, when I'm saying that there's only one reason why two organizations negotiate, um, it's because they want to create value and distribute value. That is the case. Um, that, that is what motivates the negotiation to get started. That's not necessarily what drives the negotiation to be successful. That's a whole mm. different toolbox. Um, but, but, it, but, but, but that is what brings the people to the negotiation table in the first place. Um, then we have a lot of other issues that, that, that shows up. And, and as I said earlier, we are all irrational. And by the way, I don't see it being irrational as a bad thing because that's just how we are as human beings. But then we are sitting there we are facing a counterpart, and then we have all the human emotions kicking in as well. You know, back to what we said earlier, do I like, do I dislike the counterpart? Do I trust, don't I trust the counterpart? How's the personal chemistry? And all of that. And that suddenly kicks in as well. And could even to a certain point becomes more important than the financial outcome as well. So mm. um, I just want to separate, Max, by saying that, yes, yeah. the motivation for any organization to negotiate with another one is to create value. That is a fact. But... When we start doing it, we may sometimes actually forget while, while we're there. Hmm. It's beautiful. I it's love beautiful. that um, summing up and sort of uh, the goal of creating value rather than sort of pinning someone down or, or winning a fight or something to that extent. Yeah. And, and one wonders, Cal, if there is a macho way to ask a question, to ask a good <laughs> question, um, or if, you know, and again, also citizen of the U.S., greatest social experiment on earth at the same time you know we need to address a macho culture which is you know d not even rational from like a, a winning perspective it's destructive mm. um, and one wonders how to make listening active and not just in name but to make it seem like something that is praiseworthy and laudable mm. um, as opposed to mm. passive and weak um, yeah, and I, I, I think, you know, uh, I, I truly enjoy a lot of what the stuff, what Hollywood is doing, but Hollywood has been portraying negotiation for centuries like a macho game, you know, because it has to be entertaining when you watch a movie. I get it. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, collaborative negotiations are not always entertaining to look at. It's very fun to be in, but it's boring to look at. Um, yeah. So obviously you can't really portray that in, in, a, in a Hollywood movie. So a lot of Hollywood movies, <coughs> you know, I'm laughing. Uh, because I think it's fun when I'm watching negotiation happening in Hollywood movies. Unfortunately, you have people who think that's the way we should negotiate and then they copy that, you know. So that's right. partly the influence we're under. And I guess last, last thing here, Kel, I first saw you, I think in a session where you were doing a breakdown of a Ted Lasso scene. Yep. Um, and I bring that up because... It's, the, it's part of the inspiration for my mustache. I think in terms of his unconditional positive regard, um, it's an interesting counter model right. to what would be traditionally called macho. And I'm just curious right. if you want to say anything there about the use of new mediums to teach negotiation or Ted Lasso in particular, because you had a very rich and nuanced analysis of, of scenes within it. Yeah, well, I have to say first and foremost, I, I, I just love that show. I think, it, I think it's, it's outstanding. And, and, and it, it, it goes against everything I just said about Hollywood and, and producing yeah. that macho thing about negotiation, because it, it's everything but macho. Um, well, there's a few characters in there who are kind of machos, but, but in general, Ted Lasso, uh, the star of the show is, is I wouldn't consider him macho whatsoever. Uh, and I, you can learn a lot negotiation uh, by watching that show. And obviously, as I said, when we started, I'm living and breathing negotiation. So I'm a bit damaged. I see it everywhere. But if you actually sit down and watch the show and try and see what is negotiations that is happening, uh, a lot of it is negotiation happening between, uh, between people, you know. And it's not necessarily economics, it's not necessarily contracting, it's not necessarily legal, it could be everything, you know. 
Um, so there's just a lot of, 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 of negotiation going on. So there are, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of, 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 of parts of that show that is very educational on how you could and how you should negotiate. And I, you know, Ted Lasso just, he's, he's, he's playing that role so, so well. Yeah. Well, you heard it here first. Watch TV to become a better negotiator. <laughs> Kel, thank you so much for, for taking the time amidst all that. Thank you for having me. Colleen, you. you as well for joining us. Thanks so much, Kel. This is great. Thank you, Colleen. So Colleen, it was really neat to have Kel Jensen on the podcast because I I've seen it I'm seen I've seen his name everywhere. I've seen his everywhere. And so it's really lovely to put a face in that person to the name and hear their like brand of of negotiation. Um, and the thing that I'm thinking about is the the tension or synonymity of communication and negotiation. Yeah, that was the theme that stuck with me as well. And I, one of the things that is exciting to me about doing this podcast with you is that we do kind of live in slightly mm -hmm. different worlds. So I hadn't heard his name and I didn't really know anything about him. I, you know, I read his book going into it, but that was all I really knew. And um, it was interesting sort of from the top hearing that he uh, considered communication and negotiation as the same thing, only because um, as a communication scholar coming from that world, everybody in my field would bristle at it, right? Um, because communication is so many things, including a lot of nonverbal language. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and there are ways to communicate, like you could be describing something, you could be emoting, right? Or you could be negotiating. So it's a facet of communication for me, but definitely not the same thing all the time. Um, but I thought his insights in sort of universalizing communication negotiation were helpful there um, to make it a little bit more accessible. And I think that's, that's as many, there cannot be too many people saying you are negotiating. And so it will be useful for you, no matter how you label that phenomena, to review your interactions in which you're seeking an agreement or something. Um, because it is a behavior that you can get better at and the behavior that helps, uh, and you have to practice that behavior. Um, it doesn't just come from a book. Um, and um, I don't think we were shy about asking, you know, the classic presentation of negotiation um, as someone in a suit um, is something that I continue to think about as I'm coming from that kind of like corporate space, um, but also really grapple with um, versus practicing um, because just like you said, I, I think the gap between the corporate space and the academic world is, is vast. Um, and I, and I think hopefully the shared interest for both academic academics and, and corporate people is uh, promoting negotiation. I don't, I don't even know. How do you, how do you make sense of that gap? I <laughs> agree with you that it is a, it is a wide gap. Um, but I think that part of um, the overlap is this interest in sort of rediscovering and re-understanding uh, negotiation as like a necessary tool to being human and getting around in the world. And so I think there's a shared interest in sort of um, bringing negotiation and tools and bringing negotiation strategies to people um, in an effective way, either through education or th sort of through corporate training. Um, but there are, you know, there are some things that we just fundamentally think about differently. And I think some of that has to do with application. So, uh, academics can get really bogged down in the question asking, right. Um, and the nuance of all of that. Um, and sometimes that's not helpful when you're trying to apply a concept to a particular, uh, interaction on the flip side, there were moments where. Uh, in our discussion with Keld, where I felt like there were these really broad strokes of an idea um, that I wanted to get more into the nuance of. So trust was one of those, you know, um, he talks about monetizing trust, which I'd be curious to hear um, how you understood that. Yeah, I, I'm of two minds on it. Um, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking about like subject object and constructive development, which is that whenever we can put words to something to make something that we couldn't previously articulate articulatable, that it's good because it gives us the opportunity not just to identify it, 
but to like kind of put it in a box and choose to set it aside or to do something else or to open whatever it may be. So, and this is, so this is Robert Keegan's ideas and he's working in this field in psychology. Um, he says something like you have to work with people where they are before you facilitate them to a different place, which is not revolutionary, but the idea is that like people I think come to negotiation because they're interested in money or they're interested in influence or having power. So like as a quick example, the first book that I think was the first negotiation book that I truly read was called The Art of Power by Thich Nhat Hanh. And I got it because I was in high school and I was like, yeah, like I, I want to know how to like have power and like influence. And it was the most beautifully disappointing book in talking about how like true leadership or looking like prophets and religious leaders have to be aligned with the interests of other people in order to do something or to truly lead. Um, which is to say that just pursuing things for your own benefit is help. There are a lot of ways to make the, the, the field of communication or application of negotiation skills and theory valuable, right? It can translate to that. And I think from a marketing perspective, it's nice to give people concrete numbers. They like that. But I don't think it's the right approach. They're not mutually exclusive, right? Like something can be valuable beyond money and also have monetary value. Um, but I do think that at least in like the Anglophone context, value means money. And I remember I was doing a training, Professor McClintock in India, our Southeast Asian group mostly, and I kept saying value and I was getting feedback. They're like, okay, well, what about things that aren't money? And I was like, oh, oh. In, in my head, I, I actually am thinking of, of resources like energy, attention, and trust. And so I do think it's important and I don't want to, belittle the economic value and, and which isn't because economics isn't purely monetary of just like the ability to walk outside and not lock your door and trust your community like that's value to me and i want that to matter because it's an inherently good thing that could have derivative monetary value but isn't primarily valuable because it could be realized in, in money yeah i think that makes a lot of sense and I, i'm with you and i, th I think Kelt said something really insightful sort of at the end about the way that as you know as trust diminishes profits increase and i thought that was sort of um emblematic of some of the dichotomies and paradoxes that we're trying to get at here which is that trust is really important and it's it is itself a value right and so if you're communicating that using the language of money is helpful if money is an important thing right However, there are so many levels of trust, right? There's benevolence, there's integrity, there's competence. Do I think that you're a good person? Do I think you're gonna do the thing that you're gonna do? I might not need to think that you're a good person in some contexts, that might be the most important thing, right? And so I think some of that nuance of, of sorting out, okay, well, the world I come from, if I'm doing commercial negotiation, communicating trust in the language of money is really helpful because it helps partners understand yeah. that this has real value in a way that they may not see it. Right. Um, and also, I think it's important for us to talk about the broad world of negotiation and the ways in which talking about monetizing trust and breaking it down into these units of, of, of money specifically is really dangerous to the tethers that it operates under, which are usually, hopefully, without any money, right? Without any monetary value. I'm trusting you because it's right. an inherently good thing to do right. for this flourishment of both of our humanities. Right. Um, so I thought, I thought it was interesting because he kind of came back at the end just to, to describe that in a, in a macro sense. And I was like, okay, I'm with, I'm with you there. You know, yeah. as trust goes down and it is really low in America right now, that is a dangerous thing. Um, and here's why. Yeah. And sometimes I also, I think, I think we're dancing on a little bit of kind of the continuation of like the gendered conversation that at least in the space that I'm coming from in grad school, you could be, uh, a, was, the degree was a mold and you'd be a peace mold or a war mold. And roughly what that meant was like, it was just, well, are you going to security? Or are you going into development? Um, but a lot of the concepts were the same. And I think you can see that like war, which is I think coded as like male, if you're a war mold, um, associated with, I think, higher paid, Professional opportunities, but war is like such an economic devastation, inefficiency, um, irrationality, overly emotional response. So again, I just I think it's very useful. Like we're talking about to um, think about how in a like bipolarized U.S. we're coding these things, and I think negotiation is usually associated with a suit. 
And I think it's great to hear that you don't need to be wearing a suit to be negotiating effectively or to be negotiating at all. And I'm also wondering how we can expand people's ideas about what negotiation is. Because as you were speaking, I was thinking that one of the reasons that I think talking about money feels not great, besides a lot of other anxieties of our own desires and inability to see our own shadow selves, <laughs> um, I think it also evokes zero-sum stuff, right? Either I'm gaining or I'm losing. And that, I think, is the fundamental thing we try and break out of, which is to say, like, we're not saying that, like, that's not important or you won't distribute value. But before you do that, see if there's more than just, like, the dollars and cents. Yeah, and I think another piece of that is that, and maybe this is my own frustration because I, I operate in um, a different, you know, I don't I haven't ever done any commercial negotiations. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think so. <laughs> Not professionally. Um, sometimes I wish we would talk, Max, a little more openly about how some negotiations are zero sum. Yes, yes. How yeah, some yeah. negotiations are deception is very helpful. In yeah. fact, it's a very like it's very um, you know advantageous to to and knowing your other party is being deceptive is okay. You know, I was thinking about like I feel like buying a car is like the main arena to talk about negotiation often. And most of the time, you know that both parties are probably being a little deceitful about their timeline, a little deceitful about their, yeah. um, their um, yeah. you know, a, a, how much they want to spend in a car and who they have, what potential buyers. But that's okay. That's part of figuring this out. And also, like, my win on a couple less thousand dollars on this car or whatever is the uh, dealership's loss. And and sort of, there are a lot of um, bargaining, which is the, the language that Keld used, and I appreciated his distinction between those two things. But there are a lot of, I think, negotiations that take place every day that, that are unfortunately sort of in that domain. Sure. And so I think, you know, talking honestly about that also allows us to move uh, to this place of like, and most negotiations that are set up as zero sum don't need to be and would benefit by not um, yeah. being zero sum. But but I also think I, there's a little bit of me that wanted to be like, well, sometimes trust isn't helpful, you know? Um, yeah. well, I think I think you're um, demonstrating the balance we aspire to at Mindful Negotiating in terms of not overcorrecting. Like, I think we go from one perspective of like, oh, it's usually very competitive. And then we shift overcompensate and say like, no, everything is collaborative and value generating potentially. And it's like, actually, the time it would take to, to explore value in the, in the haggle you're having in a market isn't worth it. Like, right. or, or even, I mean, I guess it depends on your psychological profile. But for me, even if I'm not going to see another person again, I, it still will affect me negatively to like, feel like the relationship was bad. Right. So like, sometimes maybe that is worth like three to five to six. I, I don't know. I don't have worth much money, like depending on who you are. Um, but I think that that's like, yeah, that the economic perspective is both useful and sometimes flattening of the many ways in which there are value. And I think just to come back to it, like the idea of negotiating for everyone is like, what do you want? Okay. And how do you get it? Right. And, and how you go about getting it um, determines if usually if or how. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, it's interesting because there, that, conversation with him we hit on so many different notes um and it was interesting to sort of have three different languages of negotiation going on at yeah. once yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was really was fun it was fun and i think um there were different pieces of it that i that we could have maybe interrogated more but i liked um getting the landscape in general of okay how how do you Kel, think about negotiation and how is that maybe different from how we think about it and and yeah. what about this and um I kept I kept wanting him to talk about my mind always goes to like listening and question asking even that first question I asked about, you know, what if you have a negotiator who's like, well, I don't see it that way. I see it this way. Yeah. Um, there was a little bit in me that was hoping maybe he'd be like, well, maybe you haven't learned enough yet. Right. Maybe right, you need right, to ask more right. questions. Um, and of course, you were like so smart at sort of entering in like this is the magic trick that everybody's asking negotiators to do that it's simply not possible sometimes, which I think is an important um, thing to mention. And, it, and then at the end, he sort of talked about uh, the question process and the discovery process. And um, yeah. and so 
it, but it was sort of like, oh, okay, I, I realized we really have a different architecture for understanding a very similar thing, yeah. um, which I, I thought was just so interesting. It is interesting. Colleen, I think our a book title for us could be Talking About Listening or Talking Ooh. About Active Listening. Listening <laughs> About Talking? <laughs> <laughs> So that, I really think that like this is part of the tension in the field of like, are you being active or passive? And at least in terms of marketing or demonstrating expertise, I, I would think that this applies to academics as well. Um, if you're asking an open-ended question to someone who's asking you for your advice, that doesn't look like expertise to most people, whereas perhaps the most skillful thing a negotiator could do when they're asked about listening is to follow up that question with a deeper question. It sounds mm -hmm. like they're interested in and negotiation what's most helpful for you right because like the advice that we give to some extent like i think you said this because we were talking about just the difficulties of talking about all the really difficult things that are happening right now um i think we were talking about just like how what you say depends on who's there totally um, and the audience that you have and i think i sometimes I, I don't know if this is an affliction of people that go into this space but i'm always thinking sometimes about like what's the perfect thing to say and there is never that perfect thing. There's never that, there's never perfect there, but there are definitely better and worse. Um, and so trying to like realize that you don't have power over other people, nor should, nor is it productive to desire it so much. Um, and that there is some power in, in, in how you, how you negotiate, like you can have more or less individual effectiveness for sure. Yeah. That's such a good insight. And I think actually will help put, um, some of the things that we talked about into like a really a helpful perspective, which is that like, there is a specific language for commercial commercial ne negotiation, right? And and that language might not work in another context. And I think that's what Keld was getting at too when he was talking about lawyers and he was talking about hostage negotiators is that each yeah. of these domains have their own language. Yeah. Um, and I think you, I mean, I, you and I have talked about this a lot, which is sometimes first steps of negotiation are like learning someone's language, you know, and learning how to even sort of communicate um, in a way that feels like it's landing, right? That it's not just sort of um, evaporating yeah. before it hits ears. And we have, um, this could be a whole other podcast. I forget who it is um, in religious studies that talks about language as indication of conversion, that a person isn't really converted into a space or a community until they start using the language of that community that kind of like shows that worldview or demonstrates that worldview. Um, and I do think we need to translate the basic negotiation stuff into all the spaces so that it makes sense there. And I think what we're doing is helpful in terms of also critiquing the ideology that that language implies in terms of what's valuable and what's important and why we should do these things. And at least from kind of the negotiation space I'm coming from, which always seemed like very, well, if it's interest-based, it's amoral, right? Like we're just helping people identify their interests. Um, but that becomes more complicated when we talk about the darker sides of things and when there are less than noble interests um, and that, yeah, we're not all collaboratively negotiating and that's, that's a reality we have to contend with. I also liked your question about, um, you know, how do you hold in tension the reality that we have an emotional self that responds uh, to the truth of another, yeah. especially when you know, we do something like we ask for a raise and we get it right away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, how do we hold that intention with not just creating actors and not yep. just creating these like deceitful characters who are moving about the world, telling people yeah. what they want to hear? Um, which I think, Max, <laughs> might be something that you and I grapple with our entire yeah, tenure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I thought I really actually thought a lot about that after our podcast. And, um, and I was thinking about from my own standpoint, you know, if I don't believe in the thing that I'm negotiating, I can't do it, right? Yeah. Like, I feel like I can't just like lie out of thin air to get someone to do something. However, if I feel like if they really understood me, they under they really understood this other person, then they would be interested in it also. Then I can kind of um, do, you know, have a conversation that somebody might look at and say, well, is that the, you know, is that the full truth? Yeah. Right. And it's, and it's like, well, maybe it's a perspective of it. Um, and from another perspective, it wouldn't look that way. Yeah. Um, but, but I sort of, I'm interested in that theme. I feel you might come back up and I, I was appreciative um, to Keld for sort of talking a little bit about trust and the importance of it and why it's actually usually more valuable than we think. Um, 
and and also how there is this tension between um you know not being wholly truthful all the time and then squandering what you actually mean to communicate it remind that reminds me of something that Roger Fisher used to say on the topic of like full disclosure. I think he was, I'm sure I'm telling this not completely right. Um, someone asked something like about transparency. And he said, if, if a robber comes into your home and takes your TV, you don't need to tell them that your wife and kids are upstairs. Um, now, I think there are a lot of things that aren't great about this, such as enrolling your partner necessarily as someone who's stealing. <laughs> computer. But I think the idea is sound that it's possible to do harm in, in, in full disclosure. And I am someone that definitely struggles with separating, if there is to be a separation between full disclosure and truth. Mm. Um, and I think truth very much relates to trust. Like being in this business, I, I think requires, <laughs> if you're a negotiator, I think people should be suspicious of you. Right? Mm -hmm. That's how you identify. Like, I, yeah, I agree. You yeah. Yeah. It. Someone is going to get one over on you. Right. And I think, I think that we know that from looking at successful facilitators, mediators, people that I would call negotiators, their currency is trust. If they can't, if they're not respected, if they're, they're not trusted, they won't be effective. And like, ideally speaking, the people that are successful in this space ought to be the people that people have good experiences with that, um, reify, reify that trust in them. Um, but yeah. then also we have the whole idea of social proofing. Um, I'm like, you know, Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> right. There's always Jeffrey Epstein. Just screaming <laughs> <at everyone. laughs> like, Look, that's the best way to end up. And, and <laughs> um, well, this has been two people talking about negotiation. <laughs>